Chapter 10 of How to Write a Novel by Anonymous. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Brett Downey. Chapter 10 The Novel versus the Short Story, followed by Success and Some of Its Minor Conditions. The Novel versus the Short Story. Practice the Short Story. The beginner in fiction often asks, Is it not best to prepare for novel writing by writing short stories? The question is much to the point, and merits a careful answer. First of all, what is the difference between a novel and a short story? The difference lies in the point of view. The short story generally deals with one event in one particular life. The novel deals with many events in several lives, where both characters and action are dominated by one progressive purpose. To put it another way, the short story is like a miniature in painting, whilst the novel demands a much larger canvas. A suggestive paragraph from a review sets forth clearly the difference referred to. The smaller your object of artistry, the nicer should be your touch, the more careful your attention to minutiae. That, surely, would seem an axiom. You don't paint a miniature in the broad strokes that answer for a drop curtain, nor does the weaver of a pocket handkerchief give to that fabric the texture of a carpet. But the usual writer of fiction, when it occurs to him to utilize one of his second best ideas in the manufacture of a short story, will commonly bring to his undertaking exactly the same slapdash methods which he has found to serve in the construction of his novels. Where he should have brought a finer method, he has brought a coarser. Where he should have worked goldsmith-wise, with tiny chisel, finishing exquisitely, he has worked blacksmith-wise, with a sledgehammer and anvil where because the thing is little every detail counts he has been slovenly in detail it has been said that the novel deals with life from the inside and short stories with life from the outside but this is not so guy de maupassant's the necklace opens out to us a state of soul just as much as test does even though it may be but a glimpse as compared with the prolonged exhibition of mr hardy's pure woman returning to the question previously referred to one may well hesitate to advise a novice to commence writing short stories, which demand such infinite care in conception and execution. The tendency of young writers is to verbosity, long-windedness in dialogue, in descriptions, and in delineations of character, whereas the chief excellence of the story is the extent and depth of its suggestions as compared with its brevity in words. Should not a man perfect himself in the less minute and less delicate methods of the novel, before he attempts the finer art of the short story. There is a sound of good logic about all this, but it is not conclusive. Some men have a natural predilection for the larger canvas, and some for the smaller, so that the final decision cannot be forced upon anyone on purely abstract grounds. We must first know a writer's native capacity before advising him what to do. If you feel that literary art on a minute scale is your fort, then follow it enthusiastically and work hard, if otherwise act accordingly but after all there are certain abstract considerations which lead me to say that the short story should be practiced before the novel take the very material fact of size have those who object to this recommendation ever thought of what practicing novel writing means how long does it take to make a couple of experiments of eighty thousand words each a good deal no doubt depends on the man himself but a quick writer would not do much to satisfy others at a rate of a hundred and sixty thousand words in twelve months. No, time is too precious for practicing works of such lengths as these, and since the general principles of fiction apply to both novel and short story alike, the student cannot do better than practice his art in the briefer form. Moreover, if he is wise, he will seek the advice of experts, and, a further base consideration, it will be cheaper to have four thousand words criticized than a manuscript containing eighty thousand further the foundation principles of the art of fiction cannot be learned more effectively even for the purpose of writing novels than in practicing short stories all the points brought forward in the preceding pages relating to plot dialogue proportion climax and so forth are elements of the latter as well as the former if as has been said windiness is the chief fault of the beginner where can he learn to correct that error more quickly the art of knowing what to leave out is important to a novelist. It is more important to the short story writer. Hence, if it be studied on the smaller canvas, it will be of excellent service when attempting the larger. The attention to detail, the obliteration of the unessential, the concentration in expression, 
which the form of the short story demands, tends to be a beneficent influence on the style of fiction. No one doubts that many of the great novelists of the past are somewhat tedious and prolix. The style of Richardson, Scott, Dumas, Balzac, and Dickens, when they are not at their strongest and highest, is often slipshod and slovenly, and such carelessly worded passages as are everywhere in their works will scarcely be found in the novels of the future. The writers of short stories have made clear that the highest literary art knows neither synonyms, episodes, nor parentheses. Short story writers on their art. I cannot pretend to give more than a few hints as to the best way of following out the advice laid down in the foregoing paragraphs, and prefer to let some writers speak for themselves. Of course, it does not follow that Mr. Wedmore can instruct a novice in literary art simply because he can write exquisite short stories himself. Indeed, it often happens that such men do not really know how they produce their work. But Mr. Wedmore's article on The Short Story, in his volume called Books and Arts, is most profitable reading. Some time ago, a symposium appeared in a popular journal on the subject How to Write a Short Story. Mr. Robert Barr could be no other than pithy in his recipe. He says, It seems to me that a short story writer should act, metaphorically, like this. He should put his idea for a story into one cup of a pair of balances, and then into the other he should deal out words, five hundred, a thousand, two thousand, three thousand, as the case may be, and when the number of words thus paid in causes the beam to rise on which his idea hangs, then his story is finished. If he puts a word more or less, he is doing false work. My model is Euclid, whose justly celebrated book of short stories entitled The Elements of Geometry will live when most of us who are scribbling today are forgotten. Euclid lays down his plot, sets instantly to work at its development, letting no incident creep in that does not bear relation to the climax, using no unnecessary word, always keeping his one end in view, and the moment he reaches the culmination, he stops. Mr. Walter Raymond is apologetic. He fences a good deal and pleads that the mention of short story is dangerous to his mental sequence. So much, and so painfully, has he tried to solve the problem of how one is written. Finally, however, he delivers himself one of these pregnant sentences. Show us the psychological moment. Give us a sniff of the earth below, a glimpse of the sky above, and you will have produced a fine story. It need not exceed two thousand words. The author of Tales of Mean Streets says, The command of form is the first thing to be cultivated. Let the pupil take a story by a writer distinguished by the perfection of his workmanship. None could be better than Guy de Maupassant, and let him consider that story, apart from the book, as something happening before his eyes. Let him review mentally everything that happens, the things that are not written in the story as well as those that are, and let him review them, not necessarily in the order which the story presents them, but in that in which they would come before an observer in real life. In short, from the fiction let him construct ordinary, natural, detailed, unselected, unarranged fact, making notes if necessary as he goes. Then let him compare his raw fact with the words of the master. He will see where the unessential is rejected. He will see how everything is given its just proportion in the design. He will perceive that every incident, every sentence, and every word has its value, its meaning, and its part in the whole. Mr. Morrison's ideas are endorsed by Miss Jane Barlow, Mr. G. B. Burgeon, Mr. G. M. Fenn, and Mrs. L. T. Meade. Mr. Joseph Hawking does not seem to care for the brevity of the short story methods. He cites eight lines which he heard some children sing. Little boy, pair of skates, broken ice, heaven's gates. Little girl, stole a plum, cholera bad, kingdom come. And remarks, many of our short stories are constructed on the principle of these verses. So few words are used that the reader does not feel he is reading a story, but an outline. Mr. Hawking has the British public on his side, no doubt, but the great British public is not always right, as he appears to believe. I think if the reader will study the short stories of Guy de Maupassant and Mr. Frederick Wedmore, and digest the advice given above, he will know enough to begin his work. Each experiment will enlarge his vision and discipline his pen, so that when he has accomplished something like tolerable success, he may safely attempt the larger canvas on the lines laid down in the preceding chapters. Success and some of its minor conditions. The truth about success. There are two kinds of success in fiction, commercial and literary, 
and sometimes a writer is able to combine the two. Thomas Hardy is an example of the writer who produces literature and has large sales. On the other hand, there are many writers who succeed in one direction, but not in the other. The works of Mary Corelli have an amazing circulation, but they are not regarded as literature, whereas such genuine work as that of Mr. Quiller Couch has to be content with sales far less extensive. Now Thomas Hardy, Marie Corelli, and Quiller Couch have all succeeded, but in different ways. No doubt the reader would prefer to succeed in the manner of Hardy, but if he can't do it, he must be content to succeed in the best way he can. It is easy to talk about Miss Corelli's rot and bosh and highfalutin, but long columns of figures in a publisher's ledger mean something after all. They do not necessarily mean literary merit, delicate insight, or beautiful characterization. They probably mean a keen sense of what the public likes, and a power to tickle its palate in an agreeable manner. Still, not every man or woman is able to do this, and although such a success may not rank as one of the first order, it is a success which nobody can gainsay. Literary journals have been instituting inquiries into the cases of men like Mr. Silas Hawking and the Reverend E. P. Rowe. Why have they a circulation numbered by the million? No inquiry is needed. They are literary merchantmen who have studied the book market thoroughly, and as a result they know what is wanted and supply it. Let them have their reward without mean and angry demur. However one may try to explain the fact, it is none the less true that genuine literature often fails to pay the expenses of publication. At any rate, if it accomplishes more than that, it is infinitesimal as compared with the huge sales of inferior work. I do not know the circulation of Mr. Henry Harlan's Comedies and Errors. Possibly it has been moderate. But I would rather be the author of this volume of beautiful workmanship than of all the works of Marie Corelli, the bags of gold notwithstanding. Of course, this is merely a personal preference with which the reader may have no sympathy. But the fact remains that, if a writer produces real literature, and it does not sell, he has not therefore failed in his purpose. He may not receive many checks from his publisher, but it is real compensation to have an audience, fit though few. On the general question of literary success, George Henry Lewes says, We may lay it down as a rule that no work ever succeeded even for a day, but it deserved that success. No work ever failed but under conditions which made failure inevitable. This will seem hard to men who feel that, in their case, neglect arises from prejudice or stupidity. Yet it is true even in extreme cases. True, even when the work once neglected has since been acknowledged superior to the works which for a time eclipsed it. Success, temporary or enduring, is the measure of the relation, temporary or enduring, which exists between a work and the public mind. Failure has a still more fruitful cause, namely, the misdirection of talent. Men are constantly attempting, without special aptitude, work for which special aptitude is indispensable. On peut être honnête homme et faire mal de verre. A man may be variously accomplished and yet be a feeble poet. He may be a real poet, yet a feeble dramatist. He may have dramatic faculty yet be a feeble novelist. He may be a good storyteller, yet a shallow thinker and a slipshod writer. For success in any special kind of work, it is obvious that a special talent is requisite. But obvious as this seems, when stated as a general preposition, it rarely serves to check a mistaken presumption. There are many writers endowed with a certain susceptibility to the graces and refinements of literature, which has been fostered by culture till they have mistaken it for native power, and these men, being destitute of native power, are forced to imitate what others have created. They can understand how a man may have musical sensibility and yet not be a good singer, but they fail to understand, at least in their own case, how a man may have literary sensibility yet not be a good storyteller or an effective dramatist. The conclusion of the whole matter is this. Determine what your projected work is to do. If you are going to offer it in a popular market, Give the public plenty for its money, and spice it well. If you are going to offer a sacrifice to the goddess of art, be content if you receive no more applause than that which comes from the few worshippers who surround the sacred shrine. End of chapter 10 and End of How to Write a Novel by Anonymous Recording by Brett Downey